Hello and welcome to another lecture from my class, Psychological Testing and Assessment. As usual, I'm beginning with a webcomic, this one from phdcomics.com. It doesn't really have a lot to do with today's lecture, but it does uh, illustrate and poke some fun at, I think, uh, an experience that will be common or familiar to many people in uh, higher education, whether they're postdocs or PhD students, master's students, or, or undergraduates as well. Um, the process of reviewing papers and the way they sometimes get handed down from one level to another. Again, that doesn't have a lot to do with today's lecture because today's lecture is on neuropsychological testing. My previous lecture talked about some basic concepts in neurobiology and neuropsychology, and today's lecture is designed to kind of follow along with that. Here's an overview. We'll begin by briefly talking about what we mean when we say neuropsychological testing. And then I'll introduce the idea of brain behavior relationships. This idea is one that I'll return to, or at least I'll try to return to, repeatedly across the remainder of the lecture. Afterwards, I'll talk a little bit about attention and concentration and highlight a couple neuropsychological tests which are sometimes used to evaluate these two uh, uh, cognitive abilities. I'll talk about memory and learning and again try and highlight a couple tests. Talk about language processing, visual spatial processing, and executive functioning. And as you can see, each time I'll highlight one or two tests that are commonly used to measure uh, those cognitive or neuropsychological functions. Now, uh, to be clear, these are not the only tests uh, that are used for these purposes. They're not maybe even the best tests. They're merely the ones that I'm familiar with, and they're ones that are fairly common, and thus I think they reflect kind of a nice set of examples that you can learn when you're thinking about neuropsychological testing. Okay, so let's get started. Neuropsychological testing. Neuropsychological tests are designed to give us information about particular psychological functions or processes that arise from particular structures within the brain. So from the, that perspective, or from the perspective of testing, it would be really nice if there were specific connections from structures to functions to tests, such that if I was, if I wanted to know about a particular part of the brain, I could administer a particular test of a particular function that I know comes from that part of the brain. Thus, I could, with my test, tell if a person had suffered a lesion or an injury in a part of a brain without having to, of course, crack open their head and look. The problem with this is that the tests that we administer typically don't me measure one and only one function. You think about this, even like a test of um, of verbal ability, like a simple vocabulary test that you could fill out on a piece of paper, it doesn't just measure verbal processing, whatever that all involves. It also measures things like attention and concentration and motor ability to move your pencil or pen across the page. It's just the case that even the best neuropsychological tests, like the best psychological tests in general, are not always as specific to just one function or one process to, that they want to measure. Moreover, those functions and processes themselves are quite varied and interrelated. So in order to have something like verbal comprehension or verbal processing, you also have to have things like working memory and attention and so on. You can't easily uh, isolate one and only one psychological process and function. And even if you could, uh, there's every reason to believe that in most cases those structure or those functions or processes tend to arise from different distributed and interconnected parts of the brain. Thus, with some exceptions, it's rarely the case that a test tells us about one and only one function that arises from one and only one part of the brain. The connections exist. I don't want to sound entirely sort of uh, agnostic and uncertain about this. Connections exist between structures and functions and tests, but they aren't as specific as we might like. Again, the tests that we have tend to measure multiple functions. Those functions often, uh, if, uh, if not always, arise from multiple structures within the brain, and those structures aren't exactly isolated from one another. Moreover, neuropsychological testing 
as a practice is quite diverse. The type of clients who uh, undergo neuropsychological testing can be quite different. They can be uh, young children or even infants. They can be people who are uh, a bit older and have suffered injuries or, or disease that has damaged their nervous system. They can be, of course, uh, older folks who are suffering age-related declines in functions or age-related um, degeneration in structures. Um, there are lots of different assessment questions that can come into play or can be posed when we're doing neuro neuropsychological testing. What is this person's current status on any of a number of different functions? How has that status changed over time? What do we know about differential diagnosis of one sort of neurological disease as compared to the other? Um, and also, there are just lots and lots of different neuropsychological tests. So although we sometimes refer to this as neuropsychological testing like it's one thing, it's in many ways a lot of different things. So if you were to look up in a good textbook or maybe on Wikipedia neuropsychological testing, you'd probably see a lot of different headings or chapters. Things like attention and concentration and processing speed and motor performance and sensory acuity and working memory and intelligence, aka mental ability. Those are all things which are sometimes part of neuropsychological testing, as are things like language, processing and comprehension, uh, various types of mathematical or visual spatial calculations or, or uh, processes problem solving, abstract thinking, sometimes things like mood or even psychopathology are included in neuropsychological testing, and all the different things which comprise executive, def uh, executive functioning or decision making can all sometimes be kind of lumped in or gathered under the heading of neuropsychological testing. So with all this diversity and, and kind of interconnectedness, how do we make sense of all of it? How do we understand neuropsychological testing in a way that is not too complicated or too, uh, too beyond us for, uh, for just basic learning? Well, I found that there are two helpful related ideas. Uh, that is the idea of brain behavior models and information processing models. And I'll explain in the next few slides kind of what I mean by that. Brain behavior relationships are just that. They're attempts to map certain aspects of behavior onto structures of the brain, however imperfectly that mapping may be. And one example of a set of brain behavior relationships is the simplified information processing model developed by Raytan and Wolfson. And I put the little, little parenthetical question mark here because I don't know how simplified it is. It's fairly complicated. The idea here is that the responses to a particular test item or stimulus, the behaviors uh, you know, necessary to do a test, whether it's pointing your finger or checking a box with a pencil or moving blocks on the table to arrange them into a particular pattern, require certain sorts of certain sorts of brain processes. And we can kind of understand what these are and use tests that target these processes, at least in some cases. So here's a diagram from the information processing model. And you can see here that in order to answer a particular test question, you have to have first some sort of sensory reception of the stimuli associated with that question. So you might, if it's an auditory question, you have to hear it. If it's something that involves a pictographic stimulus, you have to be able to see it. If it's a physical stimulus, you have to be able to touch it, or indeed you have to see it and touch it maybe. You have to then be able to direct your attention towards the relevant features of that stimuli and concentrate on them. You have to have some sort of memory and learning to allow you to extract information and retain it. Then broadly speaking, you have to do either some sort of uh, language processing or some sort of visual spatial processing to solve whatever the problem is or respond to whatever the prompt is. Then you have to have some sort of executive functioning that allows you to organize your behavior and regulate it in a goal-directed way, that is, to produce an answer to the question. And then you have to have some sort of motor output, whether it's, again, moving your hand or pressing a button or moving a block or so on. Now, again, this is simplified in the sense that it's, well, it's relatively simple given the rich complexity of human uh, behavior, um, but it's trying to suggest a pathway where we get from 
interacting with a test item, again, whether it's a question that is read aloud to you or a picture you see on a piece of paper or a set of blocks that are put in front of you if you're the test taker, all the way down, all the things that your brain has to do to get you to the point where you're producing an answer, uh, a behavioral response to that question or that item. So what we want to do now is try and focus on some of these levels of processing. Now, arguably, someone doing neuropsychological testing might have a set of tests that are able to peg, or at least ideally able to peg, each of these different steps in this process. I don't have all of those. I'm not a neuropsychologist by training. I'm just someone who teaches classes on this stuff and I'm curious about neuropsychological testing. So for the purpose of my lecture, I'm highlighting some areas uh, in this process or some steps in this process, specifically attention and concentration, memory and learning, various left and right hemisphere processes and executive functions because I think they're good there are good places to start learning about neuropsychological testing. And I think we can identify some good examples of tests which are designed to assess steps in the information processing, you know, steps in this brain behavior relationship uh, at each of these different points. All right, so let's uh, take a look at uh, attention and concentration. Now, attention and concentration isn't just one thing, or even, I suppose, just two things. It's probably better thought of as a collection of functions or processes that include things like directed attention, you know, orienting, shifting attention, selectively moving attention from one uh, stimulus to another, or dividing attention between two stimuli, sustained attention, that is, maintaining attention on a particular stimulus or target over time as you track its uh, activity in time or space or being vigilant for the appearance or disappearance of a particular stimulus. Again, any of these uh, features or functions could be thought of as, a, as an aspect of attention or as an aspect of concentration. And these involve multiple interrelated structures throughout the brain. As, as far as we know, attention and concentration aren't really localized to just one part of the brain. And you'll hear me repeat this point across this lecture. There are very few functions that we want to study that are entirely localized to just one part of the brain. There are probably, you know, different features or different parts of attention and concentration that happen in different parts of the brain. Now, however we choose to think about it or whatever flavor or type of attention and concentration we're particularly concerned about, it's clear that attention is really important. It's important for learning and it's important for testing. Um, it's basically the gateway or, you know, to all the other subsequent steps in our information processing model. And we can see that when we look at children in school environments, if they're unable or unwilling <laughs> to pay attention. It's very difficult for them to learn. It's very difficult for them to process information or solve problems or generate the appropriate outputs uh, when asked to answer questions or respond to test items and so on. Similarly, we can see that attention is important for testing purposes. You know, if you are someone administering psychological tests of any sort and your subject, your test taker, is not paying attention properly, either because he's unable to or he's unwilling to, it's very difficult to gather any inf interesting information about them. Attention is important. It's, it's this gateway, at least after basic sensory perception, which I suppose is an even more primary uh, or original gateway. So at the level of studying testing attention, there are, I'm sorry, of studying attention and concentration, there are a number of different tests that a neuropsychologist might use. I'm just picking a few of them. One is the test of everyday attention, or the T. Um, it's useful, I think, because it distinguishes between different types of attention. And that's kind of handy, because as we see, attention isn't just one thing. So for instance, it has the ability to measure selective attention, sustained attention, switching attention between different sources. It's also kind of a neat test because it has pretty decent, we hope, or we think ecological validity. A lot of the items on the test are based on everyday objects and tasks. So as compared to other tests, which use highly abstract stimuli, the T uses uh, sort of real world stuff, which maybe helps support the argument that measurements, uh, that um, measured levels of attention uh, in this task would map well onto real attention in the real world.
the validity of the test uh, has been evaluated in a variety of different populations. It's been used and, and it is, it's still used with people who have various sorts of head injuries or have suffered uh, things like strokes. Uh, it's, it's been studied with people who have dementias like Alzheimer's disease and also just in normal aging populations. And um, to simplify a very large amount of literature, basically test, the test shows predicted group differences. So if you were to compare people from a younger age range to an older age range, you see predictably that those at older age ranges have decreased levels of attention and concentration. Or if you compare people who've sustained head injuries to those who have not, the people who've sustained head injuries have the predicted, uh, have predicted deficits in their attention and concentration. Um, that generally supports the validity of the test as a means of assessing this feature of neuropsychological functioning. Another common uh, type of uh, test for attention and concentration is the continuous performance task or CPT. There are actually a number of different continuous performance task type tests. You know, one of the most common is the Connors CPT. You can obviously see uh, an image of the software here. It's a computer administered test. Um, it measures things like attention and distractibility. So it can give you uh, measurements of sustained attention, of vigilance, and so on. Another test, one that I'm a little bit more familiar with because I have one of them, I've administered it, is the test of variables of attention, like the Connors CPT. It's one of these tests that's administered on a laptop or desktop computer. The test subject sits there and has to make responses to stimuli as they pop up on the screen, either engaging in a response every time a stimulus appears or refraining from engaging in the response every time a stimulus disappears and so on. These types of tests, and again, there are a number of ones which are in some ways more or less similar to one another, have nice features in that they measure different uh, types of attention or different attention processes, like um, detecting uh, a, a stimulus, uh, measure, um, they measure errors of commission and omission, that is measuring responding uh, errors when you respond when you shouldn't, you made a commission error, or you're supposed to respond when a stimulus pops up and you fail to respond, you've made an omission error. Um, people like these because they seem to map well onto the types of problems with attention that we see uh, among, for instance, children in school settings. Are they able to sustain attention on stimuli like what the teacher's saying or what he or she's writing on the board? Do they tend to make commission errors where they blurt out answers to questions before listening to all of the question, or do they make omission errors where they miss important information and fail to respond, and so on. So people kind of, people, especially people in educational testing settings, like these type of tasks because they seem to give information about the types or flavors of attention and concentration that are often relevant or of interest to those folks in those settings. Another nice feature of these tests is they're all computer administered and scored, so they're relatively easy to use and many of them produce nice kind of scoring outputs which give suggestions for um, ways of doing uh, diagnostics or ways of even um, addressing potential problems with attention, so that's kind of a nice feature of them, especially for applied settings like schools or so on. What do we know about the validity of these type of tests? Again, it's a very large literature that, uh, of, te of, um, of studies where these tests are used with a wide variety of different populations, you know, groups that have brain damage, groups that have um, effects of drug intoxication, people with severe psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia. Of course, there's a very large literature with uh, the study of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And to really generalize and simplify across this large literature of studies, tests like the Connors and the Tova basically tend to show predicted group differences. So people who have brain damage tend to do worse at them than people who don't. And people who have schizophrenia tend to do worse at them than people who don't. And people who have ADHD tend to do worse at them than people who don't generally supporting the, the claim or the, is generally suggesting the validity of these tests for measuring these types or these uh, features of attention and concentration. So if you uh, slide the video back a little bit, you can take a look at our information processing model and you'll see that after attention and concentration, we kind of move down the processing model to memory and learning. Once you've taken information into your uh, 
uh, brain behavior system through your sensory organs and you've attended to features of that information, you have to in some way hold those features in memory and learn from them in the sense that you extract important information about them. Like concentration and attention, memory and learning aren't really one thing, or they're not even two things, they're rather a collection of functions and processes. You'll, you'll hear me repeat that phrase again and again and again throughout this lecture. Um, we sometimes use a, a kind of a, a further variant of the information processing model when we think about memory. Uh, we call it sometimes the storage model, where we um, look at how information is passed through different stages of cognition from very short-term uh, sensory memory that just captures immediate sensory input for very short periods of time. Then via attention, we can bring in that information into short-term memory or working memory where it can be maintained indefinitely if the person who's working on the information can rehearse the information or process it and then it can be potentially put into long-term memory storage where it may stay for who knows how long it's very difficult to memory uh, to measure the span of long-term memory of course we can measure to some extent retrieval from long-term memory if we ask people to recall information that we've previously given them perhaps early in the testing session and so on so this storage model we can think of it as kind of like a specific type of information processing model that's really focused on memory and it's useful for us in the sense that it highlights that memory again is not one thing it's probably best thought of as multiple things or steps in a kind of process of processing a process of processing a way of processing information so again storage models suggest that there are things like sensory register where we have kind of flash sort of iconic or echoic memory for visual or auditory information then we have short-term or working memory where we can maintain some of that information through rehearsal and then long-term memory where we can hold that information over time and potentially even elaborate on it you know connecting it to other pieces of information we have ideally this is what deep learning is like when you're studying for a class or reading in a particular literature you put things into long-term memory and over time you can connect them to other things in long-term memory and hopefully develop a rich set of interconnections that supports that information and help you maintain it over time hopefully that's what you're doing doing right now as you're listening to me um, well we'll see hopefully again where is memory in the brain well this is another one of those examples where memory is widely distributed throughout the brain there isn't just one part of the brain that does memory as i think i mentioned in a previous uh, lecture we know that there are some parts of the brain that seem important in memory like the hippocampus seems to play a role in long-term memory that is in moving information from short-term or working memory into this more permanent storage we know that if you impair the activity in the hippocampus by for instance using a great deal of alcohol um, you can have black blackouts or memory loss. We know that people who have damage to that parts of their brain have loss of long-term memory functioning. But outside of that, we don't have a great sense of other parts of the brain as being incredibly specific to other features of memory. Um, once again, like a lot of our functions we're interested in, it's fairly widely distributed throughout the brains. How do we measure memory and learning? Well, there are lots of different tests. I'm just gonna highlight a few of the ones that I'm familiar with and I think are fairly common. One is the Wexler Memory Scale. And as you would guess from the name, this is produced by uh, Pearson Sycor and the group of uh, test developers who do all the Wexler tests. Uh, one of the nice things about this is it distinguishes between some of the different types of memory and some of the different processes in memory. So different types of memory, it measures, it allows you to measure auditory memory, visual memory, and relatively immediate or short-term memory as compared to relatively delayed memory. That's nice. So, you know, if you're, if you're trying to conduct a rather fine-grained um, assessment of someone's memory and learning, you might want to choose a test which allows you to measure memory in different ways for auditory information, for visual information over short-term and over long-term. Another really nice feature of this test is that it is co-normed with the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, meaning that when the test was developed, it was given to the same group of people who were used to develop and kind of refine the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. So you can have a sense of how well your particular participant, or I shouldn't say participant, your particular subject or client who you are testing, your test taker, 
is doing relative to other people his or her same age, also relative to other people with his or her level of general intellectual ability, as measured uh, by the WACE. What do we know about the validity of this instrument? You'll guess how this is going to go. It's been evaluated with a variety of different populations. Again, people with brain injuries, people with uh, dementia, people with normal aging. And as you might guess, because some of these slides start to sound a bit repetitious, that is if you have good working memory and you're kind of maintaining this information as we go, um, these tests show predicted group differences. You know, the test, um, tests of memory functioning with the WIMS, that's the Wechsler memory scale, the WIMS, um, tend to suggest people with brain injuries do worse than people who don't have brain injuries, people who have Alzheimer's tend to do worse than people of the same age who don't have Alzheimer's, and people who are older tend to do worse than people who are younger. Of course, this supports the general validity of the test. Another test, uh, one that I, I, you know, I'm familiar with, or I, I, it's been a long time, but I, I used to administer, is the Wide Ranging Assessment of Memory and Learning, the RAML. And it looks a little bit like this, and a bit like the WIMS, it distinguishes between different types and processes in, uh, in memory. Um, it's a more elaborate test than the WIMS, it's got a lot more parts to it. One of the nice features of the RAML is that it, it sort of distinguishes memory in terms of visual memory and verbal memory. Um, I haven't really made that distinction earlier. You know, I talked about short-term, uh, you know, sensory memory and short-term memory and long-term memory. This distinction between verbal and visual memory uh, may be important, especially for people who are working in school settings. You know, we sometimes, uh, teachers will make referrals because they'll have students who seem to have trouble mem remembering information they are told. Uh, as compared to information that they are shown, or, or, or indeed vice versa. And the RAML allows you to take each of the different types of um, memory that it measures and get a score for verbal version of it and visual version of it. And that can be nice for some applied settings, especially like educational testing settings. Um, other features of the RAML, it includes uh, actual memories, of, or measurements of not just memory, but also of attention and concentration working memory, recall, and recognition, and those are sort of getting more long-term memory. So I like the fact uh, in this test that it measures attention and concentration, because again, we think of attention and concentration as kind of like this gateway into memory. If we go way back to that information processing model. You, know, you can't remember things that you didn't initially pay attention to or have some amount of concentration of. On. So it's nice that the test gives you a measure of attention and concentration, then a way to measure working memory, and then a couple different ways to measure long-term memory or storage, each of which can be done in terms of verbal or visual processing. What do we know about the validity of this measure? Well, it's been evalua uh, evaluated with a variety of different populations, uh, including especially children, because it's a test that's sometimes done with children, especially in school settings. And as you might guess from the way this has gone so far, the test shows good predicted group differences. You know, the, the groups that we expect to differ in terms of their memory and learning do differ in terms of their memory and learning. If that wasn't the case, we might question the validity of the test. Maybe it just doesn't measure what it says it's supposed to measure. Another way we can look at the validity of this test is to look at its convergence with other tests of the same uh, processes or functions. So if we compare uh, people's scores on a RAML to their scores on the WIMS, we see that those scores are pretty highly correlated, as well we would expect. If they weren't highly correlated, we might say, gosh, you know, these two tests, each of which supposedly is measuring uh, memory and learning, don't seem to be that closely related to each other. So maybe one test is not that good, maybe they're both not that good, or maybe memory learning is just such a diverse and kind of heterogeneous set of processes that it's very difficult to measure them consistently with different types of tests. Thankfully, that's not exactly the case, as complicated as memory and learning are. We do see generally good convergence uh, between different tests of memory and learning. Not just the two that I mentioned here, but in general, most tests of memory tend to be fairly highly correlated with one another. Okay, so we're moving down the information processing model. We've done uh, uh, attention and concentration, memory and learning. Now we get to the point where we're sort of dividing. There's almost like a, a fork in the path uh, of our information processing model where we're going to explore either 
language uh, processing, or we're going to explore visual spatial processing. Let's take a look at language processing first. This is, again, really not one thing. It's rather a collection of functions or processes that involve things like verbal fluency, semantic fluency, memory, and even executive functioning, a, an aspect of cognitive processing that I originally put a little bit later in the information processing model. Where is language processing localized in the brain? Well, it's, again, it's not just one structure, one part of the brain that does all your language processing. Um, in general, though, it's rough, it tends to be, for most people, localized into more of the left frontal and temporal lobes. Uh, and we know that because we uh, see language loss, aphasias of various sorts, associated with damage to left frontal and temporal lobe. So, like other uh, neuropsychological or cognitive processes, um, language processing is fairly broadly distributed, but we can say that it tends to be more left than right lateralized. So how do we measure different aspects of language processing? Well, if we wanted to measure <clears throat> um, phonemic or semantic verbal fluency, we could administer the Controlled Oral Word Association task, or COAT. This is just a simple task where we ask people to produce as many words as they can within a particular time period um, that have the same sound to them. So we could say, give us all the word, give me as many words that you can that begin with A, or give me as many words that you can can that begin with S within a short time period. People who have larger phonemic fluency will produce longer lists. People who have more limited fluency will produce shorter lists. We can also do a similar sort of thing with semantic fluency. We can say, you know, in the next uh, period of a minute, give me as many names of animals as you can, or as names of fruits as you can, or names of places as you can, and so on. People who have greater semantic fluency will produce longer lists. People who have less fluency, less ability to produce, will have shorter lists. So the COAT is a really simple test. It's something that you could administer with just a piece of paper and a few sets of instructions, as compared to some of the tests I've described earlier, which are large batteries, which are published by test companies. The COAT I'm sure someone out there has published a version of the co-op, but it's something that you can probably find on the internet for free or semi-legally posted on the internet, or you can even make it up yourself. What do we know about the validity of the co-op? Well, it's sensitive to differences that we might expect. So people who have more education tend to have greater semantic and phonemic fluency than people with less education. That makes sense there. They've encountered more words in most cases. There are some normal aging differences that we can see uh, in performance on the co-op. And, and various sorts of neurological or psychological disorders differ in sort of predicted ways in terms of their fluency. So, I mean, I can think way back when, I think this was even before graduate school working in a psychiatry hospital with people with very severe schizophrenia and among the other tests I administered to them under the direction of a, a psychiatrist was a version of the co-op and um, unsurprisingly people with very severe schizophrenia tended to have much uh, decreased uh, semantic and phonemic fluency as compared to people with no schizophrenia but there was some treatment effects so that as they got better in response to medications and other treatments, their fluency tended to increase. That kind of went in the predicted direction. Um, I said before that the co-op kind of, I've described it as sort of existing on its own. Truthfully though, it's actually included in many other neuropsychological batteries. Um, I guess I haven't really made this point yet, but in neuropsychological testing, there is kind of an older tradition of using a lot of individual tests that you as the neuropsychologist might have access to or might have specific training in. And you maybe you've got so much experience with those tests that you would just, depending on the type of client you're sitting with, the type of case you're presented with, the type of uh, referral questions you're trying to answer, you might say, okay, I'm going to administer the co-op, I'm going to measure the trail making task, I'm going to administer the whatever other tasks you want. Like you kind of pick your own collection of tests that you think are appropriate for this client. Um, that's a somewhat older tradition, although I'm sure there are plenty of neuropsychologists who still cleave to that tradition. A more modern tradition is to use a standardized battery of tests, which is published by a test development company. And when you look inside of many of these, 
we'll see an example of this in my next lecture, um, when you look inside many of these, you see familiar faces, so to speak. So like the coat shows up in a lot of neuropsychological batteries because it's a pretty easy to administer test that gives us some information about some aspects of language processing. It's clearly not the whole story, but it gives us some basic information about how well or how poorly a particular person's neuropsychological uh, I'm, I should say a particular person's language processing is. So I gave you one test for language processing. To be clear, not the only test, not the best test, just one test as an example. Now let's consider the other kind of a fork in the road, uh, the other the, the other path we could have taken. This is visual spatial processing, and you can't do a lecture about visual spatial processing without at least one M.C. Escher pain, painting, or I guess these are pencil drawings, so there it is. And you'll never guess, visual spatial processing is not just one thing, rather it's a collection of functions and processes like visual spatial analysis, visual attention, again a bit of a callback to an earlier stage in the, in the information processing model, memory, again a bit of a callback, executive functioning, something we see a little later on, and motor control. Notice how difficult it is to disambiguate neuropsychological functions. We can sketch out on a piece of paper an information processing model that kind of makes sense to us. Like information has to come into the brain, then it has to be attended to and concentrated upon, then it has to be remembered, then if it's language stuff it has to be processed in this one part of the brain, and then we have to develop motor output, but then we have to decide what sort of motor output we're going to do, we can write that out and it will seem sensible on a piece of paper, but in reality, if we go to test any of these putative functions, we often have to simultaneously test other stuff because there is a kind of a, an integration of these functioning in our overall brain behavior uh, process, if you will. So if all that seems a little bit rambly, just take home that once again, when we're looking at visual spatial processing, we're not really looking at one thing, we're looking at a bunch of things, some of which harken back to earlier stages in our information processing model, some of which anticipate later stages in our information processing model. So visual spatial processing, like language processing, isn't very localized, but it is somewhat localized, tending to be more in the right frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. Why do we know that? Well, we know that because people who sustain damage to those parts of the brain tend to develop losses in visual spatial functioning, apraxias of various sorts. Um, so, you know, if you have damage to the right part of your brain, most people will, will suffer visual spatial processing deficits. If you have damage to the left part of your cortex, especially your front and temporal lobes, you'll have language processing deficits. Um, so, not totally localized, but somewhat localized, somewhat more so to the right side of the brain. There are many tests that you could administer that gather aspects of visual spatial processing. Obviously, if you think back to tests like the Wexler et al. intelligence scale, you'll remember the iconic block design task. That's often, well, it's not often, it's always used to gather information about visual spatial processing. A more uh, kind of old school and in some ways more humble test uh, of visual spatial processing is the trail making task. This is a task that looks a little bit like the image you'll see on the screen right now. When you administer this, uh, you give the person a sheet of paper with some dots on it, or some circles on it that have numbers or they have numbers and letters. And then the person's job is to connect uh, a line following the numbers or following numbers and letters alternating in a different version of the trail making task. You know, A1, then A, then two, then B, then three, then C, and so on. Trying to make one continuous line that traces all of the dots from beginning to end within a particular time point. That's a trail making task. And there are different versions of it. There's like an A version and a B version. And you could probably find online for free or semi-legally posted online right now versions of the trail making task. What do we know about the validity of this task? Well, it's again, it's sensitive to differences uh, in age and in impairment and dementia and in injury in ways that we would expect. If you compare people who have sustained damage to the right side of their brain to people who have not, you see that those in the former group tend to have worse pro performance on the trail making task. They make more errors, they have a harder time finishing within, they have, they have more difficulty finishing within the allotted time and so on. Similarly, you see uh, you know, declines with aging and declines with dementia that kind of map onto what you would expect.
And kind of like the co-op, the trail making task, you could administer it on your own, especially if you're kind of a neuropsychologist of a bit of an older vintage. You might just have a briefcase with a number of little neuropsychological tests and you might in a moment whip out the trail making task because you want to get some basic kind of quick information about a client's visual spatial processing. Uh, what you might also find is if you're a, a neuropsychologist who likes to use batteries of tests, when you open up your battery of tests, you might find that one of them is a, uh, a trail making task. It's part of like the visual spatial processing index of that task. Okay, so we're moving along. Uh, we've gone past uh, uh, language and verbal and uh, visual spatial processing. Now we're at executive functioning. Um, and I feel bad. Like when I made this lecture, I, I just did a, uh, an image search on one of the free clip art sites that I sometimes use when I make these lectures. I typed in executive and wouldn't you know, it's a picture of an el somewhat older white fellow uh, giving some sort of a speech or an address. Um, that's the picture of executive. Now, let's be honest, there are women executives, there are people who are not white who are executives. It's probably a little bit of a disappointment to me, and maybe you're disappointed as well that this is something that just pops up when you look at Google. We can do better than this, people. We can find a more diverse representation of executives. And next time I make a lecture or next time I update this lecture, it's on me to do something a bit more inclusive and multicultural. There we go. Wow, that was a slight digression, but an important one. Let's move on. Let's talk about executive functioning. Again, you've heard this before. You're going to hear it once or twice more. It's a collection of functions and processes that involve things like learning rules, planning responses, initiating the appropriate response and inhibiting the inappropriate response, being flexible when rules change and so on and so on. These are all the things that seem particularly important to us when we're trying to solve a puzzle and there are right moves and wrong moves or we're trying to answer a question or respond to a task demand and there's a kind of a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. Executive functioning is really important because many of the things that we do in life, whether it's at school or at work or interacting in social settings, require these types of things. Learning the rules, being flexible, planning your responses. People who do well at this tend to be good at stuff. They tend to be successful in their various endeavors. People who do poorly at tests of um, at executive functioning and its various forms and processes tend to do poorly at those types of tasks in their lives. Thus, it's no surprise that neuropsychologists and other folks are interested in measuring them. Executive functioning is not is somewhat broadly distributed, but it's fairly localized. It's somewhat localized to frontal lobes of the cortex. And how do we know this? Well, again, it's a bit like the story of kind of old school, old school um, sort of neurology. We noticed a long time ago that people have damage to this part of their brain tend to do poorly on tasks that require learning rules and being flexible and so on and so on. I think in my previous lecture I gave the very famous example of Phineas Gage who sustained damage to his frontal lobe and showed changes in his behavior that were consistent with impairment in executive functioning. Um, certainly when we look at dr acute drug effects like acute alcohol intoxication we see decreased functioning in the frontal lobe that seems to explain why people who are drunk tend to behave in ways that seem kind of either overly rigid or lacking in flexibility or they tend to do wrong and impulsive things and so on and so on. Those seem to reflect failures in executive functioning probably because those parts of the brain, the frontal lobes, are in some way uh, impaired. Their functioning is either temporarily or perhaps even permanently impaired. So how do we measure executive functioning? There are lots of different options for this. One of the most common or probably one of the most famous examples of this is the simple Stroop task where you have to inhibit a prepotent response. So you have to say when doing the Stroop task, at least the classic color Stroop task, you have to say the color that the words are written in, not the word, uh, not the color that the word is. So you'd have to read or you'd have to respond red, blue, green, yellow, green, <laughs> black. I'm tired. It's hard to do it. So you can see that in the, or perhaps you could hear, in each case I had a prepotent response to read the word because of course as an academic, as someone who's gone through schooling, I read a lot. You do too. And you read enough that when you see a word you almost in immediately want to read it and say it. It's hard to 
inhibit that response and choose instead the correct response, which is reporting the color of the ink or the color of the letters. Something you can easily do if you have normal color vision, but that is hard to do if you have a prepotent response. It takes some amount of executive functioning to choose the right thing to do, especially if you're in a speeded situation where you have to respond quickly because you have a limited time or where you get more points for the further along you can go without making mistakes. Another test that is sometimes used is the Wisconsin card sorting task. It's a, a task which measures rule acquisition and flexibility in learning new rules. Uh, there are different ways to do this test, but typically what happens is the uh, participant is given a card and they have to pick which of a set of cards it is matched to. So in this case, you know, uh, imagine you're the participant and you've been given the card with the two red crosses. It might be the case that card number one is the match if the match is based on the rule of color. It might be the case that card number two is the match if the match rule is number. Or it might be the case that num card uh, number four is the match if the rule is shape. Um, now, you're not told what the rule is, but over a few trials you learn because you'll you'll select an option and the person administering the test, the test administrator, will tell you if your selection was right or if it was wrong. And so you learn the rule and you're like, oh, okay, we're clearly matching based on color. Then, after a few more trials, the rule changes. You're not told it changes, but you start getting it wrong. And your job then is to learn the new rule. And there are a variety of different calculations you can make using the, the Wisconsin card sorting task to um, try to see how quickly people can learn rules, how quickly they can shift rules when it's time to shift to a new rule, and this gives you a sense of some features of their executive function. Again, that kind of rule learning and rule changing, that cognitive flexibility that seems to be a component of uh, executive functioning. You know, what do we know about the validity of this instrument? The Wisconsin card swing task has been around for a long time. I think it was first developed in the 40s, and there's a large amount of literature that's been done with it. Um, people with various sorts of cognitive impairment compared to people with not, people with dementia compared to people with not, people with schizophrenia, which uh, can be associated with deficits in frontal lobe functioning and not. And as you might guess, if we were to average across this large body of literature, we'd say that in general, the test shows predicted group differences, which sort of supports the validity of this task as, or this test as a way of measuring some features of or some components of executive functioning. Wow, that we got through that one in a little over 45 minutes. That's a, it's fast for me. Many of my lectures run on pretty long. Um, here's a preview for what we'll talk about next time. I want to introduce the R bands. The R bands um, is a battery of neuropsychological tests, you know, all sort of put together, they all work together and yield a, a set of scores, kind of like the Wexler et al. intelligence scale. Um, I like it as a way of learning about neuropsych testing because it's a good simple example. There are other batteries of neuropsychological tests that are far more complicated that I'm less familiar with and I'm not really qualified to teach much about, but I can tell you about the R bands. Um, it's a good example of like that approach to neuropsychological testing that uses a standardized battery of tests. And I like it. I like the R-bands. Um, anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for your attention. It's been a while since I've recorded one of these videos. It kind of feels good to be back, even though I made a ton of mistakes and had to go back and re-record a bunch of stuff. I suppose you probably won't hear that. Um, if you have time, sit down, make yourself a cup of tea. Uh, I'm going to do that because I am tired. Uh, and then I'll be back fairly soon with my next lecture on the R bands and I'll have some more assessment lectures coming up pretty soon because it's been too long and I want to keep going with this series. Okay, thanks so much and bye bye.